Today's reading comes from Luke chapter fourteen, verses one and seven to fourteen. Listen for the word of God. One Sabbath day, Jesus went to eat dinner in the home of a leader of the Pharisees, and the people were watching him closely. When Jesus noticed that all who had come to the dinner were trying to sit in the seats of honor near the head of the table, he gave them this advice: When you are invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honor. What if someone who is more distinguished than you has also been invited? The host will come and say, "Give this person your seat." Then you will be embarrassed, and you will have to take what take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Instead, take the lowest place at the foot of the table. Then, when your host sees you, he will come and say. Friend, we have a better place for you. Then you will be honored in front of all the other guests. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then he turned to his host. When you put on a lantern or a banquet, he said, "Don't invite your friends, brother, relatives, and rich neighbors." For they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then, at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Today's message is not just raised, exalted, and will be delivered by Pastor Larkis. Good morning, everyone. The grace and peace of Christ be with us all today. Well, I think one thing that everyone agrees on in Taiwan is that food is really important. Meal times, and especially nice dinners, well, they're really important times to us all. They're important times not only to enjoy great food, but to get to know people. To use those times to build friendships, and sometimes we even use those meals to strengthen business relationships or do other types of work. I think if I look back on my time in Taiwan, a lot of memorable stories I've had from our years here have happened at dinners. To give you an example, about oh, about half a year or so after our family arrived in Taiwan, we were invited to this really lovely banquet, this banquet dinner. And because we were the foreigners at the table and still fairly new in the country, everyone at our table wanted to know how we're going. So, were we settling in okay? Were we used to eating the food? Were we used to living in Taiwan yet? And I told them how we really loved it. Everything was so fantastic. We really loved living in Taiwan. It's such a great place, especially the people. Everyone here is so nice and friendly. And Taiwanese people are just so polite and kind and considerate of others. When I said this, the man sitting next to me leaned over to me and said, "You don't drive, do you?" <laughs> and he was right. We didn't drive, <laughs> but I didn't. I didn't really understand what he was getting at. But about a year later, about a year later, both Sarah and I started driving here. And then I finally realized what he meant. <laughs> But let me say, my opinion hasn't changed. My opinion hasn't changed. I still think people here are great and kind and considerate. But why is it that so many people forget to be that when they get into their cars? People drive on the wrong side of the road. They purposefully block others or push them out of the way. They drive through red lights. They drive into incoming incoming traffic. It's just kind of crazy to see. One morning, when I was taking Jude and Darius to school, there was a driver behind us who just got tired of waiting for the red light, and so we watched him. We sat there in the car and we watched him behind us drive his car up onto the footpath, honking his horn at the pedestrians to get out of the way, and then he just drove past us on the footpath to get to the corner and go around the red light. 
And we just couldn't believe it. We couldn't believe that someone would do that. But it's easier to believe now because all of this stuff is put up on YouTube and everyone can see it. It's amazing that they have all these channels on YouTube showing these crazy ways that people drive. It's as if people pull out onto the wrong side of the road and think, well, I'm the most important person in the world and everyone else can just move out of my way. They just want to push their way through. Even one of my seminary students back many years ago, a really lovely young lady, she once admitted to me too that she has this problem. She said that she doesn't know why, but as soon as she gets into her car, her personality just changes. And even her friends refuse to drive with her now. Of course, people in lots of places have this same problem. A friend of mine lived in China for a lot of years, and he said that you kind of just get used to it. You get used to pushing and shoving your way through other people. He never really realized that this had become a habit for him until he went back home to the U.S., and he said he was there on holiday and he remembered to go, going to a department store and going up one of the escalators there. And it was a busy department store and there were lots of people on the escalator and he just pushed his way through. He just pushed his way through and got to the top. And it wasn't until he got to the top and looked back and saw all of those horrified faces behind him that he realized what he'd done. It's really easy to fall into this type of mentality, this type of self-centered mentality where you just think of yourself first and then you do whatever it takes, whatever it takes just to push everyone else aside and get ahead. I think that's the same mentality that we see today in today's Bible story. The story opens with Jesus going to a very nice dinner. Well, at least it should be a nice dinner. And after all, it's at the home of someone important. It's at the home of someone with money, prestige, and a high social position. He is a ruler of the Pharisees. And this host invites a group of important people to come join him at dinner. The guests include other Pharisees, together with lawyers and religious experts. And they're an elite group. They're an educated group. They're social and religious leaders. And they're joining this special dinner at the ruler's house. But while it should be a nice dinner, straight away, straight away at the very beginning, we get the feeling that it's not going to go very well. We may even be wondering to ourselves why Jesus is even there. Jesus isn't exactly a high-class person. He's not a religious leader. But straight away in verse 1, we find that the other guests, well, maybe they have the same question. Maybe they're looking at Jesus and wondering the same thing. Our English translation says that the people there were watching Jesus closely. But that's not a very accurate translation. The Greek word here really means something more like to stare at Jesus, to look at him in a hostile way. Who is this guy? Where's he come from? What's he doing here? He doesn't belong in our group. He's not one of us. He's not important like we are. Sadly, I think a lot of us know what it's like to be stared at that way, to be looked at that way, to be looked at and judged by others and have that feeling of somehow not fitting in, not being good enough. We know how much those stares can hurt us. But then when the time comes for dinner to start and for the guests to take their seats, we see something really ridiculous happen at this dinner. Suddenly, these elite people, these respectable people, these educated leaders, they all start pushing and shoving. They all start trying to get to the seats that they want, those very best seats at the front of the table. It's just craziness to see people act this way, grown people acting this way. We think, who would do such a thing? Have you ever seen children playing musical chairs? Maybe you remember playing that at school when you were younger. How the kids walk around the chairs, walk around in circles, round and round and wait till the music stops. And then as soon as the music stops, they all try to push the other kids aside and grab a seat while they can. 
I imagine Jesus standing back, standing back and watching these religious leaders doing the same thing. Just watching them fight and push and try to get the best seat. There's actually a great story that comes from about a hundred years or so before the time of Jesus about Judah's king, or Judea's king, Yeneas, who puts on this wonderful royal banquet, a royal banquet at the palace to welcome some foreign ambassadors who have come to visit. But when it comes time to sit down for the banquet, one of the Pharisees who's there, one of them who's been invited to dinner, Rabbi Simeon ben Shetach, he moves right up to the very front, right where the king and queen are, and he pushes them apart and squeezes his chair in between them. And I think we've all accidentally done embarrassing things before in front of other people. And, you know, we feel bad for doing that. But that's nothing compared to this. I mean, it's been over 2,000 years now and people are still talking about what Rabbi Simeon did at that royal dinner. That was just embarrassing. But so many people want to be the best. So many people want to be at the front. But to get that so-called honour, sometimes people let their pride and their ego get in the way. They use their pride and their ego to push others out of the way. And then the result is they just end up often embarrassing themselves. Is that really how honourable people should behave? Is that really how social leaders should act? When Jesus sees the Pharisees and the guests acting this way, he gives them some good advice. He gives them some really practical and sensible advice that we too can follow today. Stop all this proud pushing and proud arguing. Stop all this proud pushing forward to be in the front of others. Stop trying to lift yourself up and act better than everyone else. Because in the end, it's just going to lead to failure. It's just going to lead to embarrassment. If you try to lift yourself up in this fake type of way, someone will eventually come and put you back in your place. Because there's always someone more important there. There's always someone more important. Someone you may be overlooking. And yes, we know when we read this story, we know, we see this arrogance of the, of the guests there, we see this, we see this ridiculousness, and we know that really there is someone more important there. At this dinner party, there is someone who's more distinguished, someone who's more important than all of the others, but the others just don't realize it. Because in Jesus, God himself is there in that room. In Jesus, God himself is there, but the other guests are too focused on themselves to see it. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, we have this amazing verse. It says to us, Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers, for some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. But that's also a scary thought because that also means that maybe some of the people that we've pushed aside, maybe some of the people that we've shoved out of our way to get in front, maybe they've been angels or God himself even and we just didn't realize it. God was there at this dinner. God was there at this dinner and we want to kind of lean into the story. We want to whisper to those Pharisees, don't you realize who that is? Don't you realize who's there? We feel embarrassed for them that they're acting this way. We feel embarrassed for them that they're pushing and shoving for the best seat and pretending to be the greatest there while God himself is standing there, standing back patiently and watching. It's just a disaster. But I don't think we should be too harsh on these guests. I don't think we should be too harsh on them because in our own ways, we often end up doing the same thing. Jesus comes to spend time with us. He comes to be with us. He comes to share our lives with us, to, 
to just accompany us, to be with us. But somehow we too refuse to give him the most important place in our lives. So often we don't give Jesus a place of honor at all. Instead, we too, we push him to the back of our lives and we kind of ignore him. Sometimes we do that so we can take the best place in our lives for us. We ignore Jesus, we pretend that he isn't there, and we put ourselves or we put our pride or we put our desires at the very front. The amazing thing is that when we do this, when we ignore Jesus, he doesn't yell at us. He doesn't scream at us. Just like at that dinner in today's Bible reading, Jesus stands back. He doesn't angrily shout at the others. He doesn't say, hey, don't you know who I am? He doesn't say that. He doesn't reveal that he's God. He doesn't demand that others get out of his way or demand that they give him that place at the front. Jesus is too humble for that. And just think about that for a minute. God himself is too humble to make demands. Jesus is too humble to make demands. So we push others out of the way. We push others out of the way and we think we are so great and we end up doing something that God is not even daring to do. Jesus is humble. He's not demanding. And he encourages us to be that way too. The importance of humility is the real key to this story. That's what we hear in that important saying in verse 11. That's what Jesus wants to teach us there. That we should be humble, just like God is humble. We can't let our pride get out of hand. And we can't use our pride to lift ourselves up above everyone else. Because that's, that's just fake in the long run. It doesn't mean anything. It's not real. People who lift themselves up will always fall back down and end up being embarrassed by it. But if we're humble, if we're humble, God will lift us up. And that is something real. If it's God's hands that lift us up instead of our own hands, if it's God who raises us up, then no one will ever be able to pull us down. To explain this, in verse 11, Jesus uses a really important word. It's an important word, but one we really don't use very much anymore at all today. That's to exalt. To exalt. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. Exalt is an old-fashioned word, but it's a wonderful word nonetheless. Because to exalt someone, that's more than just to lift them up. Here, Jesus isn't saying that, well, if you're humble, if you humble yourself and humble yourself from your normal position, that he will come and lift you back up to the spot where you were before. Here, Jesus isn't saying that if you lower yourself and think of others first, that he'll come back and put you back where you started. No, that's not the idea here. God's loving action God's loving action never just puts us back at the start. God never just puts us back where we were before. That's a bit how lawyers and judges think. Oh, someone stole your money? Don't worry, we'll make sure that they pay that money back and then your life can go on like it was before. But that's not what God does. Because when God exalts us, he doesn't just put us back to where we were before. He lifts us up higher, higher than we've ever been before in our lives. God lifts us up past where we've always been, past where we were before. That's what God's promise to exalt us means. That no matter how bad things may be, no matter how bad things may be going now, God will lift you back up. And he won't just lift you back and put you where you were before. He will keep lifting you higher than you've ever been. He'll pick you up and put you back somewhere higher, somewhere greater, somewhere more wonderful than you've ever been before. So Jesus' promise is to exalt us, to lift us up high. 
And that promise isn't just for this life either. It's not just for our lives here and now today. It's also for the life to come. One day when everything comes to an end, one day when we will all join in that great feast together with Jesus, on that day when we stand in front of that table, maybe a lot of us will be a bit nervous. Maybe a lot of us will wonder if we're even in the right place, if we deserve to be there. Maybe we'll think to ourselves, well, who am I really compared to all the other great people who are around us? I'm not a church pastor or a church leader. I'm just an ordinary person. Just an ordinary person who prayed a bit and hoped in God. Or what did I ever do really except to be sorry in my heart and to pray to God and ask for forgiveness? I'm not the most important person. I'm probably the least important person here. So maybe in our own eyes, that's the way we feel. But it's not the way that Christ sees us. I think we'll be surprised on that day. I think we'll be surprised when we find that the best seats at the front aren't reserved for the proud or the great, those wonderful heroes. We might be surprised when Jesus takes you and me by the hand and leads us right up to the very front to sit beside him there. That's a wonderful thing to look forward to. But finally, in today's text, it's not just the behavior of the dinner guests where we see problems. It's not just in the guests' crazy behavior that we see the problems of pride and social ambition. Jesus' first piece of advice was for them, but his second is given to the host. Jesus says to him, well, don't just be friendly to people or invite them to dinner so you can just use them for your own ends. Don't just be friendly to people so you can use them for your own benefit. Don't be friendly to people just so you can get something back from them later. And certainly don't invite people just because you want them to admire you or to respect you. Instead of doing something to raise your social profile with people, instead of trying to impress people around you, do something that will impress God. Do something that God will admire you for. After all, God's respect, well, that's permanent. God's admiration, that's permanent. If we just try to get in close with people so we can lift ourselves up on that social ladder, then again, we're just really using our pride to lift ourselves up, and that way is so fake and temporary. Because others may give us respect, but that respect is so short-lived. They can give us respect, but then they take it back again just as quickly. How many teenagers can tell us this truth about happily being part of the group one day, and then suddenly the next day finding themselves pushed away? And how many of us have seen the warm arm of friendship reach out to us, only then to disappear once people get what they want? That's not the way it should be. That's not the way that real hospitality or real friendship should be. Real hospitality, reaching out to others in friendship and fellowship, that's more than just using people to make ourselves look good. It's more than just using people to get what we want. It's about seeing other people as real human beings. Seeing them as real human beings, regardless of their social position, regardless of what they can give us. That's why Jesus says, reach out to people who can't pay you back. Extend a hand of friendship to everyone, even to those who won't help you to boost your social status. Maybe other people won't understand this. Maybe your friends and colleagues won't admire you for it. But God certainly will. Maybe others will think you're just wasting your time with these so-called useless and unimportant people. But God never thinks that. After all, isn't this what God did with us? In Jesus, God came to be with us, 
In Jesus, God came to spend time with us. In Jesus, God came and sought out ordinary people, fishermen and tax collectors, the sick, sinners, the rejected, and he shared time with them. He ate together with them. He included people who had often just been left out. But best of all, in doing this, he included us too. Every month when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we remember this amazing, amazing thing, that Jesus took his own advice here. He invites us to dinner. We're not special people. We're unimportant people. We have no chance of ever paying Jesus back. We have no chance of ever deserving an invitation. But he invites us anyway. He invites us to dinner. And Jesus wants to spend time with us. He wants to include us, even though others may not think we're very important people. That's a really great blessing that we get from God. But what makes it even greater is that this blessing is one that we get to pass on to other people. God reaches down and he pulls us up high. He reaches down to us, grabs us and exalts us. He lifts us up. And the wonderful thing is that we have the chance to do that too. We have the chance to do that when we spend time with others. We do that when we reach out to others who are so often overlooked, to those who are rejected or those who often just get left out. Maybe it's not with a dinner like in today's story, but maybe it's just simply a friendly word. Don't ever underestimate how much you can do with a friendly word. Don't ever underestimate how much joy you can bring to someone just by speaking a kind word to them. When you reach out in kindness to someone, someone maybe at work who just sits there day by day alone, or when you include someone at school, include someone who usually gets left out of activities, then you too get to exalt them. You get to lift them up. You get to lift their hearts higher than they ever were before. It's strange because these sound like such tiny, tiny things. These are tiny actions that will never be on the front pages of the newspaper. But in these tiny little acts of inclusion, we too get a chance to practice doing what God does for us. We get a chance to practice raising others up, a chance to practice lifting them up high, to fill their hearts with joy, and to let them feel exalted in this way. To do that, to do that is a reward all in itself. But you know what's even better than having a reward just in itself from doing that? What's even better is knowing that God, our Heavenly Father, sees that. He sees us doing those things. And he's incredibly, incredibly proud of us when we do. Let's pray together. Loving God, when we go through hard times in life and are feeling very down, you come and you exalt us. Your love reaches out to us and lifts us back up, not just to where we were before, but to a place higher than we have ever been. Help us now to share that love with others. Help us to put our pride and self-centeredness aside and to lift others up with us instead of pushing them down. In the encouraging words that we say to others, in the kindness that we show to others, help them to know that this is also what your love is like, that this is your love reaching out to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and redevote our lives to following Jesus today. Let's stand and pray together. Most merciful God, we confess to you before the whole company of heaven and one another that we have sinned in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. Forgive us our sins, heal us by your Spirit 
and raise us to new life in Christ. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all of our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us following in the way of Jesus Christ. Amen.